Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Margaret Tando. I'm the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion here at the College of Medicine. And I would like to welcome um, all of you um, to our six, wow, six years, Tiffany. Yeah. Tiffany, six years to our, our MLK Health Equity Lecture. Um, the MLK Lecture uh, was created in 2013, actually, as a way to inspire our community to engage in campus dialogue community engagement and civic education around the topics of race and its relationships to health disparities and the national narrative on uh, diversity and inclusion. Thanks to the generous support of the, our dean, Dean uh, Rick Page, this is his first MLK um, Health Equity Lecture, the, uh, uh, Dean Page and uh, alumni. Yes, it's good, we have an awesome dean here. The uh, lecture has grown tremendously, and we are pleased that members of both our um, university and also our local communities um, can um, come and participate each year. Uh, each year, we have sought uh, speakers that include scholars and thought leaders whose leadership, scholarship, perspective, and viewpoints enhance um, our understanding and appreciation for inclusive excellence. Um, Dr. Martha Luther Luther's co uh, quote is very um, poignant to um, this lecture. It says, of all forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and in inhumane. These words were uh, by Dr. King in 1966 du during a speech to the um, me Medical C Committee for Human Rights. As we celebrate his work and, and his his life, um, we um, all are here to work towards um, ending the injustice around health uh, disparities within populations around the world. And it is with great pleasure I would like to introduce Dr. Russ Tracy. I have to say that Russ um, told us about Herman four years ago. He said, this guy <laughs> needs to come here to talk to us in this setting. And so Russ, will now introduce uh, Dr. Um, Herman Taylor. And again, I want to thank you all for coming this evening. Well, it's a distinct pleasure to introduce Herman. You know, my wife this morning gave me some advice. She said, Russ, um, be brief and say nice things. <laughs> Those of you who know Herman know the second part's easy. Those of you who know me know the first part's hard. So <laughs> I've, I've written down some things just to keep me brief and on track here. I'll give you some of the usual stuff first. Uh, Herman is a super accomplished person. Um, he's an uh, um, undergraduate degree at Princeton in biology, good degree. Uh, Harvard for MD and his Master of Public Health. He did his residency at UNC and then down to UAB, the University of Alabama, Birmingham for cardiology and interventional cardiology. So he's fully vetted in that sort of way of thinking about this stuff. He has 200 papers. Um, he's an invited speaker everywhere. I counted you did 12 or 13 in the last two years or so. Uh, he's very highly prized for doing that sort of work. But I want to say a little bit about Herman from my own personal experience. I, I met Herman about 20 years ago as he was the founding director and PI of what's called the Jackson Heart Study. NHLBI finally figured out that we needed to really engage with African Americans in this country to understand heart disease. It took them a while to get there. And so they initiated the Jackson Heart Study. Now this uh, began, uh, like many N NIH funded programs, underfunded, <laughs> and Herman had the task of creating a vision and uh, uh, a, a, a way of working, a structure that would accomplish the goals. That was not really spelled out. And under his leadership and, and vision, I have to say, it's enormously impressive. They, they took what was a pretty run-of-the-mill standard epidemiology program mm -hmm. and then built on that to include training. So it's got a huge training component from fellowships all the way up to junior faculty and community outreach and interaction. So they have a great program in their community. So now what was a pretty run-of-the-mill program is a world-class epidemiology program in the traditional sense. It has an, an, an electronic health record-based component that is, is fantastic nationally, and it has this training compo component and some emerging uh, uh, health services research. 
Now, you might say, well, Russ, you did a good job reading the CV, but I've been on their scientific advisory board almost from the beginning. We, we currently are their biorepository and central laboratory. So we, I've worked with these guys for a long time, and I can tell you the status of that program as a national level, uh, high quality epidemiology program really began when Herman started in 1998 and, and took his vision and enabled it in a really meaningful way. So uh, I, I won't say too much more. Um, it would be f you would enjoy hearing about his non-professional stuff. You know, th there's a lot of civic leadership and, and commitment to the community there that I, I won't go into detail, but it's really uh, interesting and, and pretty cool. Uh, he was recently heavily recruited to Morehouse. Um, they lost a very high-profile molecular guy to a pretty good job. He became director of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at, <laughs> <laughs> at NIH. Uh, and, and so they, they wanted to change, change the model a bit. I think that's fair, huh, Herman? Yeah. And, and so he was recruited to, to develop a vision and enable a um, health-based program that was both molecular but also social in its research. And, and that's what he's busy doing now. He's been pretty successful getting funding to do that. Uh, it, it's really going to be interesting. I, for one, am looking forward to seeing that progress and seeing how it developed. Herman has truly devoted his professional life to health disparities research. I mean, I think that's fair to say. And, and today's talk uh, is, is, uh, is uh, where he currently is at. It's entitled Risk, Race, Resilience, Three Dimensions of Health Disparities Research. Uh, a terrific guy and a wonderful scientist. Let's welcome him to our community. That's amazing. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, Dr. Tracy. I did not expect that. Uh, wonderful introduction. Um, it is a great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to be here. Um, this is uh, not my very first time in Vermont, but the last time I came, it was beautiful uh, color in the trees. Um, it was just uh, totally uh, a wonderful experience. Um, Arriving last night in nine degree weather uh, was a slightly different experience, but I have to tell you, uh, I'm, I'm so pleased to be here. Look forward to uh, beginning relationships that go well beyond today. Let me open up with a story um, about a woman born um, in, uh, outside of Birmingham, Alabama. Um, her father was uh, an iron ore miner. Uh, if you don't know, Birmingham has a lot of um, iron ore, um, coal, limestone, the ingredients, the steel. That is what made Birmingham, Alabama. Anyway, um, this woman was born in the midst of that. Um, not in abject poverty, but, you know, lower class economically. Uh, her, her dad uh, sold coal from underneath the house to supplement their income. So there was coal dust constantly around. Um, she, um, as she be became a teenager, she took up the smoking habit, which we all know is uh, not a good thing to do. Um, but she wanted to look older than she was, so she took up that smoking habit. When she got married, she married a steel worker, the natural thing to do in Birmingham, which is the steel capital of the South. That steel worker, who later developed complications of exposure to asbestos, he brought home the asbestos dust every day. She would wash his clothes and so on. Uh, tobacco smoke, living in the South, eating the Southern diet, asbestos exposure. If I were to tell you that that woman died at age 55, um, how many of you would be surprised? The truth of the matter is that woman lived to be nearly 91. So it raises a question in my mind, and hopefully in yours as well. There is indisputable evidence of the great and tragic disparities between blacks and whites when it comes to health outcomes in the United States. But those group comparisons really give birth to a narrative that suggests that the health of African Americans can be summed up in disease, shortened lives, 
um, premature death for the same thing. That would be the sum total of a quick assessment of what it is to be African American in terms of your health uh, opportunities and outlook. I want to challenge that narrative and suggest that it is indeed only two-dimensional and that uh, the story I just gave is not the story of a single outlier, but the story of an overlooked phenomenon of people doing well in the face of tremendous adversity and having good health. We'll continue this discussion approximately along these lines. First, acknowledgement of the fact that American race-based health disparities are real, pervasive, and persistent. The last 30 years have been an important era in establishing the severity and extent of race, ethnicity-based disparities. Group comparisons, while incredibly useful for focusing our attention on health disparities, may contribute to a monolithically negative view of black health. Black resilience is overlooked. Its study may offer fresh insights. This is a familiar type of graph. It happens to focus on cardiovascular disease because I'm a cardiologist. That's where I think the world revolves around cardiology issues. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> what you see here is a gradual improvement in death rates over the last half century uh, for blacks and whites. Uh, but the most prominent feature, I think, and the thing I want you to focus on as we talk about disparities is the obvious and widening gap between blacks and whites. So in the midst of the, what's been called the golden era of cardiology, in the midst of a long series of advances from stents to statins and everything in between, there's been a, a significant drop in death rates from cardiovascular disease. But lagging behind are African Americans. This type of observation led, in 1985, uh, the, that to then uh, Secretary of HHS uh, Margaret Heckler uh, commissioning a major report that I hope all of you are familiar with, at least historically, if you haven't actually looked at the content. But it's a major report to look into these issues. And starting with that report, uh, an army, uh, almost literally, of investigators turned the focus of their uh, careers towards this, I, I being one of them, after I finished uh, uh, my uh, training, it, it, and that was sometime after 1985, along the time of Dr. First finishing his. Uh, <laughs> but that Heckler report was the catalyst. And out of it, Margaret, uh, with these uh, comments, as I said, kicked off the era. She observed. Americans were living longer, infant mortality was better, the overall health picture looked good, but, and I'll just quote her, that but signals a sad and significant fact, there was continuing disparity in the burden of death and illness experienced by blacks and other minorities, and discouragingly, this disparity had existed since, ever since, accurate federal records were available. And in certain places, like the state of Mississippi, you have a worst case scenario. There's a lot that can be said about this slide, but I'll draw your attention to just a couple of features. <coughs> One, the steady decline, steady, smooth decline in death for US white males. If we look at black men in the state of Mississippi, if you closely look at 1977 and 2003, you'll see that those data points are almost the same. 30 years, a full generation, no material gain, no great advance in health um, in terms of a cardiovascular, in terms of avoiding cardiovascular death. Now, since the Heckler Report, there's been clear docu documentation of several things, and I won't read all of this, but um, we clearly made the case. There's an excess of death uh, from preventable diseases. There are access inequities, quality of care inequities, risk factor differences, potency of social determinants have been focused upon uh, quite properly. And all of this 
led to a hunger uh, to sort of flesh out the database with a more granular data focused on blacks, not blacks as an afterthought, not blacks you know, added to some other larger study, but focused on African Americans comprehensively and uh, longitudinally. The Jackson Heart Study, which Dr. Tracy mentioned in the introduction so kindly, the Jackson Heart Study was at least one major investment of the National Institutes of Health towards completing that database and starting the process begun in Framingham some 60 years prior to the launch of the Jackson Heart Study of finding out what things were contributing to these disparities. Um, briefly, what this says essentially is that it was very much like the Framingham study, and I think most of you are familiar with that. But it, was a, it, it is, because it's still, it's still going on, a population-based, community-based um, study that had nearly 7% of the age-eligible African Americans involved across metropolitan <laughs> Jackson, and it, it consisted of examinations, extensive examinations, and detailed interviews with the notion that we want to learn as much as possible about um, the exposures these people have, the, the things that are happening in their day-to-day -day lives, their attitudes towards it, psychosocial measures, assessing everything from depression and stress to job strain, um, and physiological measures, uh, again, everything from uh, simple blood sugars and EKGs to cardiac MRIs, uh, cardiac CT scans, abdominal CT scans for fat distribution, and a host of other uh, things. Each examination in exam one took approximately five and a half hours. Five and a half hours. So if you ever read a paper from Jackson Heart Study, thank the African Americans of Jackson <laughs> <laughs> for making this tremendous sacrifice. Yes, there were some things that were gained, but uh, in the end, it was their altruism that made this possible and are continuing to make it possible. Now, it was a great idea, but of course, we had some early challenges. This was conducted in the South. This was an all-black study. This was brought to you by your federal government. And if any of you know anything about the history of uh, uh, human studies in the United States, you have heard of the what's popularly referred to as the Tuskegee study probably more properly known as the United States Public Health uh, Study of Syphilis in Negro Men. Tuskegee is a wonderful little town. It, it's unfortunate that its name has been saddled or, or tied to this. But <coughs> um, what this shows is a New York Times article depicting really what turned out to be some of the horrors of the, the whole study. Uh, this is a man getting a lumbar puncture that he believes is therapeutic, when in fact it's purely experimental, purely data collection. Uh, and lies like that were perpetuated to carry this study forward with untreated men, men who had syphilis infections but remained untreated for decades, even after the discovery of penicillin as an absolute cure. Okay. These guys went on to not only uh, have untimely demise, you know, syphilitic aortitis, uh, neurosyphilis, other complications, but they also affected their partners and their offspring with congenital uh, problems from syphilis, again, under the auspices of the federal government. Well, that was um, unearthed in the early 70s. Uh, so no problem for us, right? Everything's been set right. We're in the late 90s, 2000s. Well, just at that time, in 1998, President Bill Clinton did the right thing and apologized for the study. So if you are living in the South and you're black and you didn't know that there was this terrible thing that happened in the 70s. You now know, <laughs> right? So that, you know, I wanted to thank them for doing the right thing, but it did not help our recruitment. Um, and <clears throat> to really drive the point home, a brand new at the time uh, HBO film starring none other than Alfred Woodard and, and Lawrence Fishburne, very popular actors. Um, Lawrence Fishburne is on Blackish, for those of you who don't know now, but. Uh, he was popular even back then. All of this driving home that this hugely, um, hugely uh, almost abusive, may not be the best word, but this study that exploited 
these African Americans happened not 180 miles away from where I was proposing to the population that we do it, do something different. But again, all African American federally funded. And so that impacted some of the attitudes. There were some people who didn't know or who were ready to look past it uh, and thinking that now with safeguards in place, everything's going to be okay. But there was a significant minority who were not completely uh, sold. Uh, in general, medical research uh, treats people fairly. 60% uh, agree, but that's a, that leaves a large minority of people you want to recruit who are suspicious. And you can see the negative uh, assessment down to something that might, you might think is fringe, but not really. 14% agree that medical research was a way for the government to keep black people down. Now, this was at the, um, I mean, the AIDS epidemic was raging at this point. And in fact, that's not so crazy given some of the discussions that were going on. And why do I bring up AIDS? That at that very same time, you could get a serious discussion with uh, black and other intellectuals, certain, certain intellectuals, about whether or not the AIDS virus had been engineered specifically to um, attack vulnerabilities in African Americans. So there were levels of suspicion to overcome. Now, how we dealt with that specific thing is probably a whole other lecture than I came to give today. I'll just say, I'll give you some high points. And here's the biggest high point. We couldn't do it. We could not do it. The people who did it, a few of them are, are seen here. These are members of the target community, some of the older ones. We went as young as 21. But these are members of the community who stepped forward. Some of them stepped forward because they had been involved, perhaps, in one study or another, and their level of suspicion was low. As one of them said, I know I won't grow green ears by, taking, by saying yes to a medical study. Um, and there were, it was that sort of group. There were people who were willing to listen and hear what you had to say. There were people who understood that African American health was lagging behind and that research was one of the key things that they had to participate in in order to change that narrative. Uh, in fact, they selected the, uh, the tagline for the Jackson Heart Study, and that was to establish a new legacy, a legacy of health. It was those people who allowed us to proceed. I could give you a, a ton of uh, results, but I'll just pick a couple just to make a couple of quick points from the Jackson Heart Study. So one of the first things we started to do was compare ourselves with the Framingham Heart Study, just in general descriptive terms. And here you see, it may not be obvious to everybody, but uh, what this suggests is that in blue, Framingham age-matched individuals had a much higher frequency of normal BMIs than did African Americans um, because African Americans were, uh, the distribution was displaced dramatically towards the obese range and stage two obesity, where you see there's three times the prevalence of stage two obesity among African Americans, uh, approximately double the, um, the uh, rate of obesity. So that actually wasn't that much of a surprise. This may be a little more surprising, that if we looked at the normal, the normal weight, the normal BMI blacks and whites, what we saw was that among the normals, you had three times, the norm, normal weight blacks, still three times the rate of high blood pressure, significantly higher rates of uh, uh, hypercholesterolemia, and even low HDL, which in the literature, if you looked at the literature prior to the Jackson Heart Study, very often it was said that the one great thing that African Americans have going for them in terms of risk factor profiles is that they have, they have high HDLs. What we found in our study was that wasn't necessarily the case when we compared ourselves to age-matched people at Framingham. This was done carefully and, um, and verified. So, Data like those, and here's another surprise in the positive direction. Uh, you see rates of control here. I'll just point to this, in the, in the range of 60 to 66%. Um, the general uh, wisdom, or the conventional wisdom at the time was that 
African Americans had horrible control. Now, arguably, 66% is pretty horrible. That's an F on most of the tests you'll take in school, right? Um, but, uh, in fact, these numbers were comparable to those of whites in the, in the nation at, at the very same time. Um, and that was a surprise. Data from places like Baltimore and Harlem suggested that black men uh, had about a 19% control rate who were under treatment. And those data were floating around, and that was the impression that people had of black uh, persons' attempts at control. I should insert here briefly that part of the reason, uh, not suggesting all of it, but part of uh, the concern there is that so many studies on African Americans uh, historically have been studies almost exclusively on deeply impoverished African Americans. That's a very important subgroup, a very important subgroup that never should be neglected. But if you were to draw your, all of your opinions about, say, white health from Appalachia, you get a very different idea of health in Africa, uh, health in America, and white Americans, than if you got a more evenly distributed population. What the Jackson Heart Study uh, did, quite intentionally, is have a more balanced socioeconomic status in terms of median income and education. So some of the difference between what we found and conventional wisdom may relate to that. We also, and this is just a representative paper, um, documented, uh, like others, but with, uh, in a highly quantitative fashion, the, the really heavy burden of perceived discrimination and its role in generating high blood pressure in the community. And there's a slew, I'm not a geneticist, but there's a slew of uh, genetic studies that we either did alone or as part of major consortia that point to um, some of the underlying vulnerabilities and strengths of African Americans when it comes to cardiovascular disease. So uh, all of these types of things led to papers like this one, which looks at um, uh, coming up with a, a risk factor profile that's more specific to African Americans. And what we did here ultimately is find uh, one, that we could slightly improve on things from Framingham uh, as you now take what was developed on a principally white population and apply it to black ones. But we also, I think, most importantly, underscored that Framingham had, did a, had, had done a very good job of developing their risk score. And uh, with recent improvements through uh, the uh, more recent iterations of that, that it actually performs pretty well even an African American. So you can, with confidence, use some of the pool risk equations that you find in those uh, automated um, risk analyses that you can do online. But the point is, disparities are firmly established point. But is it the whole story? And is it a surprise? Of course there are disparities. Of course. Think for just a moment about the history of the African sojourn in the United States. Start 1619. Now, I'm not a historian nor a sociologist. I'm not going to go through details. But I think a lot of you know the high points. And a truly great sociologist, Dr. W.B. Du Bois, said this in 1899. One thing we must, of course, expect to find. And that is, a much higher, that is a much higher death rate at present, 1899, among Negroes than among whites. They have in the past lived under vastly different conditions, and they still live under different convention, conditions. And there's a whole litany in the literature of echoes of that early sentiment about after controlling for so many variables that we can control in our analyses, we still find that African Americans are doing poorly. That's looking at risk. Now, I opened with a story of somebody who was an exception to that rule. So question arises, is studying risk enough? Does that give you a true picture? And does studying risk give us all of the possible approaches to resolving health disparities? It's found by some that 
factors that should reduce risk among blacks often don't, or at least not to the same degree as whites. Social support in certain studies is not always as protective, important, but not as protective. Factors that should increase risk among blacks seemingly do not. Some of the poorest health outcomes among blacks noted in this study led by Dr. George Rudd were in some of the poorest areas. So we've got some confusing data here. So it seems that something is skipped, but we'll, we'll do it verbally. So in, in the face of such data that doesn't line up totally with that narrative of early death, uh, poor, um, poor health overall, those group comparisons focus on deficits. But blacks are not all the same. There is a great deal of heterogeneity among outcomes. So yes, way too many African Americans have high blood pressure. But over 50% don't. And that's amazing given some of the pressures that African Americans face in terms of not just psychosocial pressures, but the um, food deserts, the, the lack of access. Um, the uh, poor diets, 50% of African Americans still live in the Southeast where the dominant diet is not a healthy one. I, I, I trust you know that. A large majority of African Americans actually don't have heart disease. And there's this interesting phenomenon of a disparity crossover among the elderly. This slide suggests that uh, at least since 1973, since we were looking at this and still pertaining today, although the curves get closer, that if an African American lives to 85, his chances of outliving his white counterpart are fairly substantial, particularly pronounced among women. This is the death rate for uh, black women. This, the, the solid blue line, I'm sorry, this, is, this dotted blue line is the rate for uh, white men, and the solid blue line is for white women. You can see that the black male line is decidedly better, lower mortality after age 85. What is it about these extremely vigorous elderly African Americans? And one other thing. Some of you may have heard of the Evans County study. Anybody? Evans County? Evans County is interesting. Evans County is a small county in rural Georgia that um, they had one physician, uh, uh, Dr. Haynes. Dr. Haynes made an observation. He said, I got a lot of white patients that have heart attacks. I have almost no Negro patients having heart attacks. What is, and his question was, what on earth is it that protects African Americans from heart disease? coronary heart disease prevalence and incidence rates for blacks were four times lower than among whites in Jim Crow outback Georgia. What is going on? So understanding the environmental and individual promoters of cardiovascular health, I submit, is at least as important as understanding risk. And it may be important in that it will give us new approaches and new avenues that could lead to enhanced African-American health. The wonder in James Baldwin's way of summarizing all of this is not that so many are ruined, he was talking about Harlem in the 50s, but that so many survive. So to approach this, um, we uh, applied to the American Heart Association with some of our colleagues at Emory, and we were awarded uh, one of the Special Focus Research Network awards that allowed us to look at the notion of resilience in African Americans. How is it that in the face of the uh, adversities that African Americans uh, face, that, um, that some appear to be doing extremely well from a health standpoint? Okay, why Atlanta? Well, um, one, um, 
it's the black Mecca, right? <laughs> Did y'all know that? Okay. Uh, if you didn't know, if Ebony Magazine says <laughs> it's the black Mecca of the South, then it's gospel, okay? <laughs> well, in fact, you know, I heard that when I was a teenager, a lot of people. And if you go there now, you'll find a huge diversity of African-American backgrounds, not only from around the country, but also outside the country, uh, new Americans. It's a beautiful place. Um, and uh, all of these things are true. I won't read all of that. But, and of course, that term Mecca informed the acronym Mecca for our study. Um, and now, what is Mecca? Well, we wanted to look at some ideas that might um, begin to shed some light on this whole notion of resilience. And we admit at the outset that resilience has definitions that might be multiple. It is a complex concept. It's not one thing. But let's define resilience for the sake of this study as uh, doing well while black. OK? <laughs> let's just make it simple. All right. So population project. Identify an at-risk. So there are three projects. We want to look at contextual uh, issues, you know, the, sort of the environment, social determinants of health, if you will. We wanted to look. Uh, clinically, are there certain markers that uh, track along with people who are doing well despite challenge? And finally, a, a basic science project to look at some epigenetic uh, machinery that might help explain, if we could find the phenomenon, uh, the phenomenon of resilience among African Americans. All right. So, <clears throat> aim one, are, na are there neighborhoods with unusually low or high rates of cardiovascular disease for a given level of SES. SES <coughs> being one of the strongest indicators of whether or not you're going to be healthy or not. Uh, are the people, uh, are there community level environmental factors that support the resilient community phenotype? Uh, do individual characteristics uh, of community resident, residents differ in those neighborhoods that are so different? although they're similar in terms of uh, money in the neighborhood. And do these uh, uh, factors individually jointly predict cardiovascular risk profiles? Now, this was uh, the population level, so that's as far as the population level goes. Um, but the studies, the projects are interlinked, as I'll explain. OK, so are there these communities that stand out? All right, so we looked across uh, Metro Atlanta, which is a huge part of northern Georgia, as you can see. And we looked at census tracts. Um, the data was from tw uh, 2010 to 2014. And we looked at uh, the amount of uh, black cardiovascular death in these neighborhoods, black cardiovascular emergency room admissions, and black cardiovascular hospitalizations as the major indicators of how the neighbor, neighborhood was doing in terms of cardiovascular health, OK? Now, <clears throat> to fast forward, because this part of the study is, is uh, completed in terms of data, although all the data anal analysis has not happened, if you control for median black income, gender, and age, what you find is that you actually can identify neighborhoods that have comparable median incomes, but vastly different cardiovascular outcomes. So there were such places. You call them micro blue zones, where people are doing unexpectedly well given the levels of uh, poverty. So with comparable median incomes, Mortality rates in our at-risk neighborhoods were over, uh, well, were uh, one and a half times what they were in the, call them resilient neighborhoods. Um, the visit rates were vastly different, as you can see, nearly four times. And the admission rate, also quite different. OK, now that was unexpected. So this variation exists then, as I said, even when median income was controlled, and they were found throughout the area. And sometimes, they were right next to each other. So aim one, 
was very interesting, the results of us looking at that. So um, this looks at the survey population. So when we found these neighborhoods, we um, called people who lived in them and asked them a long series of questions. Um, and we got a sense of who the people were living in those neighborhoods. And you can begin to see some differences emerge. Again, vastly different outcomes, but very similar incomes. All right? um, you could see that the resilient neighborhoods, there were higher rates of marriage, lower rates of male, um, uh, lower rates of never married, and uh, also a lower number, a lower fraction of people living beneath the cut point of 25,000, okay? So even though the median was similar, there was a lower fraction of people who were abjectly impoverished in the resilient neighborhoods. So the next thing we wanted to do is actually assess some of the uh, environmental, so what's the context that these people live in their lives? How can we uh, get a handle on that? Okay, so we looked at some of the things that we thought might be important, aesthetic quality, walking, safety, violence, activities. So these are some of the blunt instruments that are commonly used to assess people's um, psychosocial environment. And uh, there's a lot of bars. The basic message is that uh, many neighborhoods were reportedly different by the residents of the at-risk and resilient tracks. So again, um, let me just point out, this is still interviews, so it's not like we went out and took pictures and actually you did those type, those levels of examination. So, but these are impressions of the people who live there, and I would argue that there's no impression more important. You know, perception can be all but reality, and if people think their aesthetic quality is bad, it's bad. So, uh, perceived violence was particularly strong, as was aesthetic quality and the others you see. Healthy food access uh, loomed large. So, again, that's kind of probably what you'd expect in a neighborhood that supported uh, cardiovascular health. Individual uh, level factors looks at those people, who they are, you know, what kind of, um, did they experience or perceive discrimination? Um, were they people who really had control or felt they had control over their own lives? We use the, um, the environmental mastery, uh, risk, uh, psychological well-being. Purpose in life, that has a historical tie-in to resilience because many psycho psychologists have told us that purpose in life uh, has a lot to do with at least psychological resilience. So we looked at that. We looked at optimism. We looked at um, a specific resilience measure, and we looked at a depression scale. Uh, some of the high points here are that several individual psychosocial perceptions are reported different, and basically they go generally in the direction you would think. In the resilient neighborhoods, there tended to be um, less reported um, discrimination. Um, a higher rates of depression were seen in the non-resilient or at-risk neighborhoods, and so on. Now, so the next question, at least at this point in the, the um, examination of environmentally determined resilience, the question is, we have individual characteristics and we have neighborhood characteristics. Um, does it matter? Um, can, you be, um, can you live in a bad place but have good um, uh, personal, affective, psychosocial um, uh, mechanisms, ways of dealing with the world, and do better, uh, are the, the effects of environment and personal characteristics additive? And the last question, the answer to that seems to be yes. So if, if both were low, if both your personal and your environmental circumstances were low, then you had the lowest mean um, Life Simple 7 score, which is a measure of cardiovascular health. And this being a population study, this not having hard clinical data at, at this point, this is our proxy at this point in the evaluation uh, for uh, outcome, okay? 
You all with me? So if you had both personal uh, characteristics and there were neighborhood characteristics that suggested that there would be problems, they added up to, to be even worse problems. If you had both high, that is, you live in a great neighborhood, um, even though the median income is the same as the next neighborhood, uh, say next door, if you lived in this great neighborhood with great characteristics as you perceive them, as well as having personal characteristics that were highly positive, that added up to a statistically significant improvement in your life simple seven score. And that's what all of that means. So in summary, at this point in this evaluation, looking at contextual and reported individual characteristics, what we see is that living in a neighborhood with perceived greater safety and less violence is clearly associated with better cardiovascular outcomes in, in African Americans in Atlanta. Among residents in the resilient tracks, these traits, environmental mastery, being in control of one's life, having purpose, psychological resilience were clearly associated with high um, LS7 scores and drove those results. They were highest, those scores were highest among individuals who lived in good neighborhoods and had positive traits, all right? And this is taking SES off the table. I should throw out this uh, important caveat. If you left SES on the table and went looking for neighborhoods that were doing well versus those doing less well, clearly SES is a huge determinant of outcome, huge. But that's a question I think that's already been answered. What we wanted to look at was those neighborhoods that were comparable, were there other factors that really rose to the top as being important? Okay, so what's next for the, the Mecca Project is that we have gone to these very same neighborhoods and uh, gotten individuals to volunteer to come in to our clinic for a, a clinical evaluation to look at a certain list of uh, putative uh, explanatory variables, if you will. And so we, um, we mentioned this. The, this is the analysis that we're uh, conducting on each of the volunteers. There's approximately 400 sampled from uh, that, um, the, uh, the map that I showed you earlier. So we're looking at inflammation, uh, oxidative stress, uh, regenerative capacity by looking at uh, regenerative cells, and an assortment of non-invasive vascular measures to look at um, perhaps um, preclinical derangements in endothelial cell function and early onset of uh, problems that could lead to cardiovascular um, uh, decline. So that's what the clinical project will seek to do. The um, more molecular investigation that, that's called the BASIC project will look at MRI, um, I'm sorry, uh, microRNA uh, profiles as well as metabolomic profiles of individuals who have been sampled from these areas that do well or do poorly. And we'll have individual profiles on them knowing whether they do well in a, in a great environment, they do poorly in a great environment, they do poorly in a great environment, or they do poorly in a poor environment. So we have that permutation that will allow us to begin to hypothesize about some of the important biochemical uh, epigenetic variables that may, may be fingerprints for resilience. So our next steps, I think I've actually done that already, except to mention that a subset of the 400 will actually undergo a more or less classic risk factor intervention to see a before and after of their microRNA profiles and metabolomics, as well as their uh, vascular indices. So resilience is simple, right? Uh, you could say it's a process of adapting, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it means bouncing back from difficult experiences. And I think it's an important and understudied aspect of the African-American experience in particular. It's complex. Um, I had the pleasure of leading a workshop on resilience at the NIH not long ago, and it was complex. Um, experts from psych psychology, um, from uh, people who spent all their time looking at mitochondrial DNA, um, people like myself who were interested in population and clinical work, 
and everybody in between had an idea about what resilience really means. So it, it is, I have to say, a multi-layered and complex idea. There's also the notion of resiliencies. You may be very resilient psychologically, but you may not be so, um, not so capable of bouncing back from some physical challenge, or vice versa. So it's a deep concept that needs a lot of uh, great minds coming to bear to see what, in sum, produces that resilient individual. And probably the integral of all those resilient characteristics points to longevity and vigor. What is it that provides or sets people up for long, vigorous lives? And we're doing a host of studies to look at, into this further. I won't go into detail unless there's specific interest in sleep and resilience, angiogenesis as a mechanism, or our, the mHealth uh, cohort studies we're looking at. The point, the major point I want to leave you with today, even given the early state of our investigation into black resilience, is that, in fact, there has been an unfortunate 400-year-long natural experiment. African Americans in this country have had a unique sojourn. You know the litany. There's the years of slavery, followed by Jim Crow, legalized marginalization from opportunity, residential segregation, which is tied to a host of systematically uh, in systematically impactful deprivations. They're the interpersonal affronts that are as large as uh, when Dr. Purse and I were in Boston having a, a, a Yale law graduate uh, being um, lunged at, uh, uh, like Lancelot style, with an American flagpole just for being a black man walking by. My purpose is not to give you a litany that I think most of you are fully aware of. These things have health consequences, and as W.B. Du Bois said, um, it's not unexpected that the disparities would emerge. But in the midst of that are people like the woman I introduced this talk with. In the midst of that, if you visit a black church on a Sunday morning and you look at the front row down to the right, of the pastor, <laughs> there will be a row or maybe two or three of mostly elderly black women, the mothers of the church. Amen. <laughs> That's real, too. These people have overcome. The woman I described lived through the teeth of Jim Crow, lived in coal, iron ore, asbestos dust, smoked, and lived to be 90. We can't ignore this and suggest that's, oh, that's kind of a freakish occurrence. No, it's not. I would extend those comments by saying that's not exclusively an African-American phenomenon, right? We have people and peoples who have gone through tremendous trials and come out on the other side with health and happiness. Sure, people succumb, but it's those people that fascinate me that also made it and made it well. They have something new to teach us. We understand more and more about risk, but let's learn more about resilience. The, uh, I use this rose through the concrete. Um, a lot of you will know that uh, Tupac has a rap about this, but uh, <laughs> those of us who are older um, might remember uh, Aretha Franklin and might remember uh, Benny Hill, going even further back, singing about this uh, beautiful young woman, the story of um, live, growing up in, um, in Spanish Harlem. His name is the Rose of Spanish Harlem. And at the lyrical high point of the song, he says, she's, she's growing up in the street, right up through the concrete. That heroic journey that so many African Americans live is worth studying. And to close, this lecture is named for Martin Luther King. The anthem of 
the movement that he led for so many years, for too few years, I should say, was we shall overcome. It's that overcoming that is understudied, that is, again, heroic on sort of a social level. But to those of us who are scientists, it poses important answerable questions about the essence of human resilience. And the answers to those questions transcend race. They have meaning for all of us, no matter our ethnic background. And I want to challenge the narrative of black health and suggest that the grand arc of African Americans in this country, in this continent, is one, is a story of survival and making it. With that, I will conclude and answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I should leave now. Uh, <laughs> I need you on my study, but go, go ahead. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. The question is, mm -hmm. question one is, yes, yes, what yes. is the population mix mm -hmm. in the desert area and right. the population density of mm -hmm. what? Mm -hmm. And the other is, are any of these factors um, present? Yeah, OK. So first of all, thank you for that tough and important opening question. Um, one. We did control for income, but I want to repeat that, which is like the major determinant. We went after communities that had a median average black income of around 47,000, which um, is not very high, but that's where we found these vastly different outcomes despite comparable income. There's a lot of interesting work that talks about uh, opportunity zones and what neighborhoods are high opportunity and low opportunity. And they have some of the characteristics, high opportunity have some of the characteristics that overlap with resilient, what we call resilient neighborhoods. And that would include the things you mentioned, the population density being appropriate, very close access to health care, um, and things that you would expect. I think it's important that this work so far, and it's still early, points again, once again, to the importance of things like access to food um, and um, experience of discrimination. That those social determinants, they keep coming back as being important in setting a, an atmosphere for what we call resilience, <laughs> as well as avoiding, uh, avoiding risk. And I think um, in terms of how, I think you asked about the racial composition a very important question. And actually, I have that data. And as you might expect, those neighborhoods that have a more resilient profile have a higher concentration of whites. Um, so although we only measure the blacks. And I think part of the answer there is opportunity often follows white people. I mean, that's, the Amer that's American history, right? And that opportunity, not only for um, you know having a grocery store around, um, uh, having a hospital or a clinic or something available, right? Th uh, having a good school, uh, good school in the neighborhood, all those things tend to track with the majority population and may be part of the phenomenon that you're, you're, you're pointing to. Great question. Yes? In the back. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> I was pointing high. You know, the, the funny thing is, I came down to talk to people before the talk. And I ran into the entire physical therapy group. 
I said, so all the medical students must sit in the back. Is, is, is that what's happening? Are there any medical students here? Are they all studying for the board? Okay, all right. <laughs> Your question, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so my name is Taylor Barrow. Um, I'm a medical master's student here, so looking to You're go into healthcare. You're what kind of student? Medical master's. So it's just before medical yes, school. Yes. Yes. So, okay. um, so I've had never heard of many of the points that you brought up, but I was thinking about since most of most of us are in school or you know going towards being in the healthcare profession, how does a lecture on resilience translate to medical education? Um, just because I'm thinking about like Serena Williams or Kyra Dixon and other people who have gone to doctors and because of how they look or their background being black and being female, right. they are thought of to be more resilient to pain, more resilient to other things mm -hmm. so that their mm -hmm. claims of you know, being unhealthy aren't taken seriously. So how do you take something like this and translate yeah. it into educating yeah. students? who are going to be future doctors or future clinicians that's of a, any sort. That's a beautiful question. Let me think about that for a second. I, I think um, there is so much in that question. So again, my basic thesis is that, it's, that black resilience is underappreciated, right? Um, and that the reason that that's an important point to make is because there may be factors that contribute to that resilience that if we knew better, understood better, that we all could benefit from. Um, for people to make any assumptions about who you are as an individual, right, um, is known to be a terrible thing to do. So um, for me to uh, come to the conclusion that because you're black, you're, you can stand more pain, or because you're black, you're more likely to complain about pain, you know, both of those are equally damaging, right? So I'm not asking people to make assumptions that all black people are resilient. That's not the point. The point is to not look past this observation that I think is something that avoids, I'm blocking on the Nigerian uh, novelist who gives this great TED talk on the danger of a single story. Okay? And some of you are nodding and you, you know this the talk. That applies here. If you only know part of the story, you don't fully appreciate the problem and you can't give well fleshed out answers. So that's the point I'm trying to make. But making assumptions about individuals is, is fraught with hazard uh, and could be, in fact, dangerous. Thank you. Yes, sir. One methodological question. Mm -hmm. So you are looking at neighborhoods, and you're right. ascribing characteristics to those neighborhoods, but this is a metropolitan area where there's a fair amount of mobility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, sure. uh, the neighborhood will not stay constant. Uh, people will come in, people mm. will go as a staff. It's a great question. Um, so what is the impact of a variety of mobility issues, like gentrification, for instance, which is going on <laughs> It, it, it's accelerating tremendously in Atlanta. Right? Um, neighborhoods like the neighborhood that Martin Luther King grew up in, you know, um, formerly all black, are probably 50-50 now. Right? Uh, and maybe get inching towards majority white because they're right there where everything's happening. You know, uh, I mean, all, all of the hipsters and millennials are walking their dogs and pushing their baby carriages, <laughs> you know, right, right past uh, Martin Luther King's old house, right? Um, so it, it's interesting, and of course the prices are going up. And it destabilizes observations like this, right? So what we try to do to adjust for that is that, um, first of all, we cut our analysis back at 2014, right? Uh, although the process had begun, admittedly. Um, but <coughs> we uh, grouped, uh, we had a criterion that said um, you were not eligible to, have to be asked these questions on the, on the survey, right? You're not eligible to come into the clinic unless you had been a resident of that community for five years, right? So the individuals from whom we're deriving the data are longer-term residents, and you could theorize that 
if there is any impact of residential environment that it might manifest in their health. Thank you. And could you speak to something that uh, coming down the pike is, uh, what type of interventions are you looking at? It's a very good question as well. So um, in, again, it was so exploratory. What we decided to do in, in making the proposal is do a fairly conventional intervention in terms of you know, uh, exercise, weight management, and such. But the innovation there was to, um, to use uh, um, an online uh, you know, web-based uh, intervention. Um, and some people had a personal coach as well as uh, not. Totally not necessarily practical for the masses, but a test of the concept to see if there would be some change in any of the measures that we took at baseline. And that's ongoing. Thank you. My man from Jackson State. I, you know, when I saw that shirt, I said, you, you see the shirt, Jackson State, huh? OK, all right, very good. My name's Eric Hobson, a medical master's student here. And I was at Jackson State University in Mississippi. Um, Go Blue Bengals. Sonic Boom of the South. Uh, <laughs> right. So you're working in um, Georgia with resiliency zones. If you were to translate that to your Jackson study, mm. would you expect to see resiliency zones in such as um, Jackson, Madison, Ridgeland mm -hmm. as, uh, as predominantly as you see in the um, Atlanta study? It's a great, great question. I wish I could throw up the map of Metropolitan Jackson to show everybody what you're talking about. But I, I suspect we could, we could. We could find similar um, kinds of uh, data wherever we went that there would be examples of neighborhoods that are doing uh, much better than you'd expect given the, the level of income. Um, Evans County is like the, out, the way outlier. I mean, those guys, African Americans in that town, you know, the black men had lower rates of heart disease than the white women, right? So that was in the 60s. But I recently looked up that data to see where's Evans County now? You know, what's happened? I mean, since then we've had, I mean, that was pre the explosion of McDonald's, right? Um, and pre uh, everybody having a job sitting in front of a computer terminal. That's when those data were originally taken. But if you go back now, even now, the African Americans have lower uh, cardiovascular death rates than the whites. I have yet to personally visit Evans County, but I intend to go down there and make sure I, I know what's in the water and other things. But it raises, again, that question of, you know, how do we explain that? You know, there may be an explanation ultimately that uh, goes completely around this whole notion of resilience, right? There, there may be some explanation. Maybe it's all risk. But I think to ignore these people, these situations that defy categorization is, is, is crazy. Uh, one other example, uh, <coughs> and I, I say this at some risk because I'm not a, a geneticist. But the whole PCSK9 story, right? Uh, the biggest breakthrough, I believe, Russ, since statins in terms of managing lipids, dramatic, dramatic lowering of um, LDLs if you give inhibitors to this gene, right? So it's probably to this gene. Where did that story begin? Now, there, there are several strains, but one of the most important ones came out of Dallas, out of black people in Dallas. There were African Americans who had extraordinarily low levels of LDL. And what was found was that they uh, had a mutation that didn't allow them to elaborate the, the, the proteins that led to hypercholesterolemia if that protein was in, in, in more abundance than it should be. It was the black outliers, the people who should have, like I showed you in our comparison with Framingham, higher levels of LDL even among the normal weight, black people who had, who were the exceptions to that rule, led the way to a major breakthrough. It's really a simple idea, right? Um, these outliers, in that case, are telling us something that shouldn't be <coughs> ignored. I may have run over my time. Um, any other questions? Yes. So um, it seems to me that the data, thank you, um, talked about that it was individuals' perceptions of their neighborhood, right. which was really what you were looking at. And so yes. my question is, 
were their perceptions in line with reality? So, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. were they indeed healthier neighborhoods than maybe the non-resilient ones? Did mm -hmm. they, in fact, mm -hmm. have more mm -hmm. opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. Or it, did you did you find that, or, or or was it just my perception was that it was, but in fact, it wasn't right. the same as a neighborhood that right. may have been not resilient? Yes, to to the extent that we w we uh, had money <laughs> to do. Um, you know, sort of going into neighborhoods. And the idea would have been, okay, in addition to census data and people's impression, to go into the neighborhoods with cameras and other things. And people have done that sort of work. Uh, we didn't have the budget for that type of work. Um, but what can be said, again, is, is really uh, what the data said, and that is that despite similarities in SES, there were still these perceived differences and perceived outcomes tracked with those differences. So that's as far as I can take it. Because yeah. one of my yeah. follow-up is wondering whether or not individuals that have resilient personal characteristics, mm -hmm. do they find each other mm -hmm. and, and form these neighborhoods? That's interesting. Or yeah. are the neighborhoods already existing in the end of, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Like sort no, of a chicken a or an egg kind of thing. It's a cross-sectional study, so it's impossible to answer those chicken and egg type <laughs> questions. So, so no, it's a great, great question. And it points to some of the other studies that we're planning, including uh, developing a cell phone network to get uh, lots of um, granular objective data out of people who sign up for it. And uh, stay tuned for that one. That's a, yeah. Uh, we got another question. <laughs> yes, OK, yes. Um, my name is Karen. Um, I went to Carter Anderson. Yay, all right. Yeah. I like my wife. Um, so I worked really hard, so I want to say the first question I have is how would you, the advice would you give to people in the black community when you hear mm -hmm. um, false medical like advertisement, like, oh, we have hypertension, when that might not be the case? How would you recommend that we hold those false data accountable so mm -hmm. we can really know the mm -hmm. real medical issues that are happening within our community? and yes, you can deal yes. with it. And also another question is, how would you apply this example of resiliency to the African-American population in Vermont? Would you yeah. think it would be different oh, based okay. off <laughs> our immigration? You mean all three Our of immigration no. with, uh, <laughs> No. <laughs> no, I'm cheating, I'm cheating. <laughs> no, no, listen, listen. I need to talk, okay, those were, Incredibly important questions, and let me see if I can remember them all. First, uh, what about a false narrative? Now, it is not a false narrative to suggest that African Americans as a group have poorer health as a group, but that doesn't say anything about you, right, as an individual, number one. It may, yeah, you may align with that, or you may not. My point is that blacks are not a monolith, right? and that there is value in understanding why, under the circumstances we find ourselves over a life course, why some do so well, live to be 91, despite all of those things I mentioned, okay? So it's not false that blacks have too much hypertension. That's true, but it's also true that there are African Americans who, um, let me, say this clearly. Nationally, African Americans, by the time they are 60, and in the Jackson Heart Study, 80% have high blood pressure. 80 per, almost everybody's a patient by 60. And I consider 60 young now. There was a time I didn't. <laughs> I think it was young. OK. But what about that 20%? Who are they? What did they do to live the American life, eat the American diet, suffer the American affronts to get to that age and have normal blood pressure. Just like the people with low LDL, they may be telling us something very important. So I'm saying two things. We've got to hold these ideas in tension, right? That one, African Americans as a group lag behind in too many health indicators. But there are huge numbers of African Americans who are doing extremely well despite the odds. And those people have something to tell us. That's my point. Okay. So one more question on this. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I'm 
Hello. Oh. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, so I didn't speak for you. Here, an AKA over here. All right. So <laughs> I know, I know. You almost <laughs> threw up the pinky when she said that, but I wasn't being petty. <laughs> uh, so my question is, is similar to hers, but in that I, I kind of, I wonder if the data that's being published, how um, inclusive it is of what what we what we tend to segregate within the African American community. For example, I know in Oxford back in 2004, I believe there was a study published that as far as a uh, plasma fibrogen, fi fibrogen, I can never say it right. Uh. It was um, it's it's higher. Black women lead the pack in the United States as far as um, fibrogen levels. But however, Black Americans, when the conversation is brought up about cardiovascular risk factors and fibrogen and plasma membrane, things like that. It's like well, black people are the lowest, we're the worst, we're at the bottom. But black women, kind of similar to our statistics in education, lead the pack for irregardless of race, ethnicity, you know, poverty level, anything. So is it makes me wonder, first my question would be, if the large majority of us have such low levels, is that, um, is that due to maybe Maybe us, I don't, I, don't, I don't know, maybe are they only evaluating people who are black American as enslaved descendants? Are they also evaluating people who are African immigrants, people who are Caribbean immigrants? Because Caribbean immigrants also had higher levels than traditional African Americans uh, for things like that. So it makes me wonder what's being included and who are the African Americans we're talking about in this data. So it's a question always, uh, thank you. It's a thank great you. question. And, and the, the point is, and to put it very simply, Black is not one thing, right? right? Um, there's, you know, the flow of genes across ethnicity and color is a reality. Continental origin matters, right. but it's not a determinant of what your genome ultimately will look like in detail, okay? So we have to, I think, again, and this is true of other ethnicities as well, when people lump you know, uh, there's value to that. I mean, it points to certain things that we need to pay attention to, but though lumping people into, say, a category of black should be uh, not considered the final answer. It may be hypothesis generating, right? But you have to begin to ask the next questions like you ask, right? Um, so I, that type of scrutiny of published data, I think, is important, and particularly for students. I, I encourage you to ask deep questions. Um, to begin to answer these things, there's so many levels. I mean, I'd started out talking about the Jackson Heart Study. That first building of trust is paying dividends in deeper understanding of these issues. So while, you know, intellectually you guys are being trained to the hilt and you, you, you know mechanism and you know a lot of scientific things, um, being a whole person, if you're going to be in this line of work, you know, whether you're a provider or a basic scientist, if you're going to do it with um, some type of direction, if you're going to have a real sense of, if the answer to your why is that you really want to help people, you have to maintain that entirety of your humanity and bring that to bear on your work. Um, so your questions are well received. I don't have the answers to them all. Yeah, you uh, answered it you, quite a bit. But, it's, but it's very, to, it's very rare to, to get in front that. of somebody like you and be able to ask. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much.